Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I had one of those moments there that I guess a lot of us do um, that wear these things. I looked up and thought, you're all really blurry this morning. <laughs> oh, that's better. Significantly less blurry. Sorry about that. Morning, everybody online. It's lovely to know you're here. Uh, I'm going to have to clean my glasses because you are all really blurry. <laughs> Even with my glasses on, it's just... It's, yeah, I should have done it before, Julie. You're quite right. But I was... Significantly not different. Um, this morning, I am going to talk about Jesus showing his compassion. Uh, there are a load of um, scriptures I could use for that, but I'm going to use one that I think very starkly shows the contrast of Jesus and the other people. Um, so... But we'll get to that in a second. Where, when you... Paul talks about this before. I say, no, this, no, this is true for Paul. Oh, um, incidentally, we have uh, at least two... I know at least two people running in the Ma Manchester Marathon today. Actually, I think I know three people running Manchester Marathon today. Because Heidi... Heidi's running as well. Oh, wow. Mad. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, please, please feel free to pray for Paul. Please feel free to pray for Paul. He, uh, he's not the wellest he's ever been uh, breathing-wise, so please pray for him. And just, and just if you can, online, encourage him, do all that kind of thing. It's, uh, he's just, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. He properly is, isn't he? He, he just, honestly, genuinely, uh, he is such an inspiration. To me personally, I'm, I'm glad he's not here, I can talk about him. To me, to me personally, I've actually told him this. To me personally, he is an incredible inspiration as to what you can do when you set your mind to it. When you think, do you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm still being a tinker winky, I want to be a marathon runner. And he's a marathon runner, he's not just somebody that ran one marathon, he's a marathon runner. And that's just, yeah, something like Dave. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a proper marathon runner, he's, he's an absolute inspiration to, to, to anyone who thinks I can't, whatever, you can. And uh, he's an inspiration to me and I've told him that as well. So anyway. Um, so Paul does this as well. When he reads things, he puts himself in the story. He, he, he lives in it. He's, and uh, So do you find yourself doing that? Do you find yourself, when you read something, you identify with the characters. You think, oh, if that was me, I'd do this, that, and the other. Or, oh, oh, they're a bit like me. I, 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 was reading, I was reading a book yesterday, and one of the characters, in the book, in the book, was talking about when they had miscarried as a younger person. And I cried. Genuinely, I teared up. And I'm reading a book, it's paper. And it's black ink on white paper. And it's... Anyway. Um, so, do, I mean, do you do that with the Bible? Do you do, do you do that with the Bible as well? When, when you read the, the Hebrew Scriptures, Abraham and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua. Who, do you identify with these characters? You know, Saul and David, Benaniah. Ben and I went into a snowy pit. Went into a pit with a lion on a snowy day. <laughs> I don't. I don't identify with that. I, I like to stay at home on snowy days. Uh, the worst. You know, genuinely, the worst thing about my new job, I can walk to work in the snow. <laughs> Honestly, As a, when it snowed like a, a, a month and a half ago, I was going out to work, and Joe said to me, "Do you know what? When you were driving for a living, you'd have had a day off today." Yes, I know I would. <laughs> But I've got to walk to work in the snow because I've made my mouth about only living a mile away and now I've got to be able to, I've got to walk there. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> what, about, what about the New Testament? What about when you read about Simon Peter? And we were, we were talking about, so we preached about Simon Peter just recently about, oh, we were the connect, group, connect group we were talking about Simon Peter and about his, his sort of impetuosity. It was Connect Group, wasn't it? Yes, yes, very much so. I think it was Connect Group we were talking about it. I don't see somebody who's in my connect group. I can't see them. Yeah. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Um, you know, James and John, the sons of thunder, Boanerges, who just, who just were young and daft. <laughs> or, or Thomas, or Mary and Martha, or... or does anybody identify with, with Saul? Saul who became the Apostle Paul. I, I, I sometimes, whenever I'm, whenever I'm writing something, I... 
identify with Paul because I use right long sentences with lots of commas and some clauses and, and all that and, and, and brackets and, and, and then Joe reads it and she goes, just, these are all too long. <laughs> just, you've massively overwritten this. Our Paul, when, when he writes to Timothy twice, self appellates as the worst of sinners. I don't, I don't know if he genuinely thought that or if it was his awareness of his failings were particularly acute because he saw God's goodness and grace with such clarity. He understood God's goodness and grace with such clarity. Maybe that, that threw his own failings into stark relief. Today we're going to look at a woman who simply named a woman. And yet everyone knows the story. So we're going to read today from John 7, 54 through 8, 11. So, so we'll come to why this, what this first verse means in a second. Then, then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made a stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. That is true, it did. But it also commands us to stone the men, and he was notably absent. Anyway, now what do you say? They were using this question as, question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger, when they kept on questioning, he straightened up to them and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at him. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Lord, this morning I want to talk about your compassion. Because you are such a compassionate God. You're such a loving God. You're such a God whose, whose grace and love throw our <coughs> lives into stark contrast. Lord, help me this morning. Lord, help us this morning gain some more insight, some more of you. Lord, help my words. Make my words fall to the ground. Lord, let your words fall into our ears, into our hearts, and grow the harvest you desire. Amen. So, a little background leading up to this encounter. This encounter is somewhere in the middle years of Jesus' ministry. It's not at the start, it's not at the end. It's somewhere in the middle. He's starting to gain some traction. He's starting to gain some notoriety. He's starting to gain some followers. He sent the 12 out, but he's not yet sent the 70 out. It's in between that bit. He started to gain some followers, but he's also started to gain some enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Shelters or Feast of Booths. That's booths as in built things, not the, not the shops selling dodgy British beef. <laughs> this is one of the three <laughs> biblical pilgrimage festivals where, where, the, where, the, where the people are exhorted to go up to Jerusalem and, and have a right good jamboree. The, the three festivals are, are Pesach, Passover, and the Jewish people remember how God saved them out of Egypt and, and the, the angel of death literally passed over them and God brought them out of Egypt. And Shavuot, festival of weeks, which is a um, commemorates the spring harvest and the giving of the Torah um, on Mount Sinai. For those who are slightly geeky like me, Shavuot is the plural of the word meaning week or seven. It alludes to the fact that the festival happens exactly seven weeks, uh, that is seven sevens, after Passover. They actually start counting on the second day of Passover and then Shavuot comes that far after it. And then Sukkot, which is the, this, is this festival they were at, they'd just been at. The, the, the first verse, everyone went to their own homes. This is the day after 
this festival. Um, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles or booths or shelters. And God says in, tells them in Leviticus, live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths. So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And the Jewish people still do this now. They, 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 they build little shelters in their back garden. And instead of sleeping in the beds, they go and sleep in the shelters in the back garden. If anybody's watched Friday Night Dinner, you'll have seen that happening on that. If you want to know more about that, read Deuteronomy 16 or other bits of your Bible. Or do what I did and look it up on Wikipedia. <coughs> if you want to know what the Lord expected of his people at those and other celebrations, read Numbers 28 and 29. And if you think God isn't interested in what you do with the money and goods he gives you, read it as well. We'll cross that out later. So, Jesus is at the Festival of Booths laying down some teachings and he's turned up a little bit late because his little brothers have come and been what little brothers are sometimes, a proper pain. I can't, I'm not, do you know what? If your mum and dad weren't here, I'd tell the story you told me about your brother last week. <laughs> but I'm not going to use Dave's brother as an example. So, <laughs> so Jesus' little brothers have been a bit of a pain. They've been a little bit little brotherish. Do you know what I mean? A little bit. And that, and we're not all like that. I'm a little brother and I was a delight. But. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe's right, that really isn't how my brother's telling. Uh, but nevertheless, Jesus is just talking about just being himself. Just generally being himself, putting the cat among the pigeons. Just before today's passage, the day before, this, this is what tees up today's, today's reading. We're in John 7. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and in a loud voice said, if anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit from whom, the, from, whom, from whom those who believed in him would later receive. This is another one of those times where a little bit of background, because we, we read that, and oh, that, that is right interesting. I believe that, brilliant. I, and I absolutely believe that, wholeheartedly believe that. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that wells up inside us. I absolutely believe that. So that scripture on its own is fantastic. But when you, when you understand a little bit more about the background, so a little bit more about the... It helps you understand just how inflammatory, how incendiary these words were. When Jesus said stuff like this, I am going to read a little bit from The One I Love by Richard Bradbury. Has anybody else read this? I knew you'd read it to me, I see that. This is great, isn't it? it, it yeah, it really is. It, it's a commentary about uh, the works of John the Divine. So it's, it's the book of John, um, 1 John, 2 John, and other Johns. Um, it's, but it's, it's really... And, 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 and when, when, we stand, when someone's standing and say, reading commentaries is really interesting, and you think like, oh, yeah, it must be. I'll go and watch some paint dry instead, shall I? Honestly, this is a right riveting read. It, you tear through it. It's got, if for no other reason, it's really short chapters. But it, it, it reads really, really easily. Anyway, that's enough. And one of our friends wrote it. So, uh, so right, talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. So every day, a procession made its way from the Pool of Siloam, where the water was drawn. And the water would be brought to the temple and poured out on the altar. So every day, for seven days, they did that and they made a big deal of it. And at the end of that, Jesus says, whoever's thirsty, come to me. The context of Jesus' proclamation is the last active day of the festival. The last actual day of the festival is the Sabbath. However, on the seventh day, the festival reached a crescendo as a priest, instead of marching around the altar once with water, would march around the altar seven times. It was at this moment Jesus shouted out this challenge, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Essentially in this, 
he is contrasting himself with the waters being poured out upon the altar and saying that he is the source of life. The water in the passage draws upon several images from the Old Testament. Firstly, it reminds us of the cleansing that was part of the tabernacle ceremony and identified with the lava. It was a washing for purification undertaken by the priests before they could enter the Holy of Holies. Secondly, it's the provision of God in the midst of the desert. Moses brought forth the water from the rock which quenched the thirst of the people. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul identifies this rock as Christ, who is the source of our spiritual drink. Thirdly, we have a reference to the waters that will flow from the temple at the coming of the Messiah, prophesied in Ezekiel, Zechariah. In shouting this out at this point in the narrative, Jesus is drawing on all three of these images. He is the one who brings cleansing as he is poured out on the altar of the cross for our sakes. He is the one who quenches the thirst of the thirsty in the dry and desert place. He is the one who has released the spirit to flow out of his temple. This is the third image that John picks up here in verse 39. That's why they were, to say they were mad with him is an understatement. They were like scalded cats. They were furious with him. But, as I said earlier, he'd got friends as well as enemies. So they didn't dare go and have a hold of him. So they decided they're going to discredit him and then kill him. So then they come up with a foolproof plan. This foolproof plan that I read earlier. They trap him between a rock and a hard place. Does anybody know the origin of the phrase rock and a hard place? I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it, it's said, it is thought to be um, an update of the expression between Scylla and Charybdis. Does anybody know where Scylla and Charybdis come from? It's Homer's Odyssey. He, he must, he, Jesus has to either say, let her go, or stone her. It's a binary thing. Those are his choices. Those are his, he, he, and, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law are right. They've, they've caught him in a cleft stick. If he says, let her go, he reveals himself to be a, a dangerous liberal. Easily dismissed. Well, oh, he's, he's a dangerous liberal. We can just ignore him. He's, he's, he's not a man of God. He preaches. But if he says, Joe, you know you're right, stone her. Stone her. Crack on. He steps beyond his earthly authority and gets into real trouble with the Roman authority. But Jesus is nobody's fool. He refuses to answer. Do you know what? He refuses snappy answers. One of the things that I've, I've been most impressed by the church in the whole the gay debate is when the church refuses to get into soundbite arguments. I've heard Paul do this again. I'm glad he's not here. I can really talk about him, can't I? I've heard Paul do this, and he's brilliant at it. When we say, I'm, I've heard Paul say words to the effect of, we're not going to cheapen and diminish anyone by pretending there are easy, simple answers which seek to demonise or discriminate one small group of people. There are no simple answers to any question. Jesus refuses to answer. He's nobody's fool. Jesus does the, the hardest thing in the world for a clever, insightful person to do. He keeps his mouth shut. It's the hardest thing in the world. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. It's not that he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer, but he keeps his mouth shut. He waits. Because he knows that that's not the time. There's a time for answers, and that wasn't the time puts me in the mind of passage in Isaiah that begins who has who has believed this message to who have the arm of the Lord revealed the bit that goes on he had no beauty or majesty to attract him he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows familiar with suffering well acquainted with grief he took up our infirmities carried our sorrows was pierced for our transgressions and yet he did not open his mouth he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before our shears, he was silent. He did not open his mouth. It's Isaiah 53, if you're taking notes. Under the severest provocation, and this was severe provocation, this was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law giving him some of this. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
And Jesus keeps quiet. He keeps quiet because he knows that the right thing to do at that time is not to answer. When we read about, in Hebrews, those verses about Jesus being tempted like we are, in every way we are, that means he was tempted also to speak without thinking like we are. Because he knew the answers. And I can't be the only one that is not only tempted, but quite often fails the test to speak without thinking, to, to use my mouth before my brain. It's, it's one of the curses of having a fast mouth. It beats my brain lots of times. Please, Lord, help me with that one. Jesus, he doesn't fail that temptation. He's tempted like we are. I am tempted to let my, my mouth beat my brain. He must have been. And in this situation, he absolutely must have been. Because he could have gone, right, you're, you're idiots. You're not doing this. You're doing that because of this and that. And he could have just, he could have properly waved his finger at them all. But he didn't because that wasn't the right thing to do. That's not the compassionate thing to do. That's not the right thing to do in that circumstance. He bends over, writes on his ground, writes on the ground with his finger. You know, also, do you have one of those, I wish I was there? But when you, when you read things, when you look at things, when you think about, do you think, oh, I wish I was there? I wish I was there. I wish I was there with Henry, the, Henry V before half Fleur, listening to him say, once, once more to the British dear friends, once more. Oh, close the wall up with our English dead. Just that, oh, come on. Front the eye of, um, no, already, I can't remember now. Squint like you're a button. Basically, is what he's saying. Or oh, some, oh, 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 some amazing sporting event, like the Rumble in the Jungle. Muhammad Ali and George Formby. Just turn that nice for one of them. Turn that nice again. <laughs> oh, what about Barnsley winning the FA Cup again? Right. What year did Barnsley win the FA Cup? Come on. Who did they beat? West. Thank you. I said it before I could. What was the score in the first half? First leg? Nil nil. What was the score? Was the final score at Bramall Lane? You reds. And um, what was the score yesterday? You reds. Anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. For for those of you that don't like football or aren't from Barnsley, tough. Um, so. So you, the things you wish you'd seen, you wish you'd seen Jesus walk on water. I'd say, I bet you this was connect group again, wasn't it? Simon Peter walk on water. Do you, um, to be honest, I don't wish I'd been in the boat because I don't really like boats and I don't like storms in boats. But I could, I'm sure I could have been on the shore and watched them both do it. Right, when Jesus calms a storm with a word or feeds 5,000 men. Right when he calls Lazarus out from the grave. When he, when he goes to the grave and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is like, <laughs> he was bound with grave clothes. He didn't walk out of the grave. Come on. He, he must have just, or he just penguined out of the grave. How about the crucifixion? You should have been there. He wept with his mother. Or the resurrection. The ascension, the Pentecost, where, where tongues of fire fell on people. Literally, tongues of fire fell rested on them. This one, this one's one of mine. I wish I'd been here for this. For this I read earlier. Because I want to know what he wrote the first time. What did he write the first time? I can make, um, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to make an educated guess as to what he wrote the second time. Because the second time, it caused, it caused those who heard to begin to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. But what did he write the first time? Do you write the words of Moses in Numbers 9? Wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. Or do you write the words of David in Psalm 37? Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. What did he write the first time? It obviously wasn't enough. Because they still went after him. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And we can make a, possibly make some educated guesses. What he wrote the second time? Did he wrote many, many tekel passim? 
God has numbered your days, the days of your reign, and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided. Because that was true of the Pharisees and teachers of the law as well. They'd been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Maybe you wrote, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You should have no other gods before me. Maybe you wrote, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be used unto you. Maybe you wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Maybe you wrote the Ten Commandments. Maybe you wrote the Ten Commandments. I started writing the Ten Commandments out. Maybe you wrote their sins. Because you knew all men. You knew what was in their hearts. Maybe you just wrote their names. Maybe that was enough that he knew who they were and where they were. Maybe, maybe he destroyed their anonymity. I don't suppose it really matters. What, what matters is he touched their hearts and their consciences. Without it being a confrontation. See, we can touch people's hearts and consciences by pointing the finger at people. We're pointing the finger at people. By pointing the finger at people. You, you there. You on the front row. But Jesus touched people's hearts and consciences without it being a confrontation. That's compassion. That's his compassion. That's his compassion being in stark relief to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Absolutely stark relief to it. And then he's there with a frightened woman and no accusers but herself. So she knows she's done wrong. And she might not know she stood before the only one who is without sin. But she knows in a very real sense she has stood in front of her saviour. She has stood in front of the one who saved her life. She knows that in a very real sense. She knows she's a sinner. She doesn't need reminding of that. She just reminding, needs reminding that there's another way to live her life. God's way. I like it. I like it as well that we don't know the woman's name. Like the woman who anoints Jesus in Bethany in the home of a man named Simon the leper. Who she is isn't as important as who she interacts with. And we could probably learn a lesson from that. I've, we recently went to Westminster Abbey, me and herself. And Catherine was doing a thing in Westminster Abbey. Um, I love that. Catherine was doing a thing in Westminster Abbey. Um, Catherine, for, for those of you who don't know in the room or online, Catherine is our daughter uh, and she's in um, she's a stage manager and she was stage managing something at Westminster Abbey, yes she was <laughs> were we proud? yes we were um, but it's, Westminster Abbey is a big church and it is, fair, it is fair, don't get me wrong, it's not Liverpool it's not Liverpool Cathedral, that's a big church but anyway, Westminster Abbey is big and it is it's lovely, but it's cluttered. Honestly, it's like my mum's house before I had to put in a care home. It's just got so much ramble and so many statues of this and crypts of that and just, man alive, it's like a, it needs a good fire sale, that's what it needs. But I, I, it, it may be the, the difference between that place and this place is just, it may be glad to be a non-conformist because it must be the devil's own job to clean. Imagine it dusted in there. It must take hundred of them to dust it every week. But anyway, uh, it, may be, it may be happy to be a non-conformist. It may, it may be again, I was struck again thinking of all the names of the people on the walls and the, the memorial to this, and granted, kings, right enough, uh, uh, to the, the great and the good and, and the not so good. And there's a statue, a full-size statue of... Wilberforce, tucked around the back. And I was, oh, good man, I like you, you did good stuff. But I was again struck of how pleased I was that we don't have any of those here. We don't have any, because that's one of, one of the things that just irks me. When you, you go somewhere and you say, like, and you see a plaque on the wall, churches are terrible for this, uh, a plaque on the wall, so the, in, in the name of Fred Bloggs, in great big letters, and then underneath it goes, to the glory of so well, hang on a minute, if it was God's glory, why is your name bigger than his? Yeah. I don't understand that. If, 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 if it's God's glory, make his name bigger and leave your name off. If we don't, it's one of the reasons that we, we don't have sort of memorial plaques here. We are going to have, hopefully soon, when we pull our fingers out, a who's who board. 
We've got the photographs, we just need to clap them on the walls over there. So, but that's, that's not because we want our pictures on the walls, it's because we want people to be able to say, oh, I need to go and I need to see who's in charge of whatever. I'll go and see their picture and then I can, oh, it's, it's them over there. Music group, oh, it looks like that. Until Rob shaves his beard off and then they'll never find him. But <laughs> there's that bearded chap, is he not here anymore? Last Jesus writes with his finger, I wonder if this is a, one of those pictures of his, his willingness to reach down and touch our dirtiness, to be hands on in our lives. That Hebrews 4 scripture I alluded to earlier. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He, when he got up, he must have had to go out. What about us? What can we learn? He gives us time. He gives us time in every sense of the phrase. We should follow his example and we should give time as well. We should use time as well. The more verses in Proverbs about being quick to, negative verses, about being quick to, that we have time for. Suffice it to say, God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And we should be too. Exodus 4, Numbers 14, Nehemiah 9, Psalm 86, 103, 145, Joel 2, Jonah 4. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. Right through the Hebrew Scriptures, right through them, from Exodus to Jonah, to Joel, one of the minor prophets. We should examine ourselves, not just before breaking bread, but before we presume to stand in judgment on anyone else. Before we Remember Jesus, Jesus tells a parable of a man with a, with a plank in his eye trying to help a man with a, a speck in his. Jesus says, get the plank out of your own eye before you try or you'll, you'll be like that. Oh, oh, let me help you. Let me help you. I'm just... Not for nothing is patience the fourth fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Patience. Patience. He gives us time. Let's not be too quick. Let's not be too hasty to dive in and tell people what they're doing wrong. He speaks grace. He speaks grace. And we should follow his example and use it as well. As I said, I said earlier, the, the woman didn't need her sin pointing out to her. She knew she was a sinner. She didn't remind, need reminding of that. I don't. I, I know my feelings. I genuinely do. What she needed to know was there was a saviour. And that's what the world needs to know. And the person of our family, our friends, our, our work colleagues, our neighbours, they need to know, they don't need to know that they're bad people. They don't need to know that they're, they're, they are sinners. What they need to know is there's a, a God who loves them and cares for them, who has grace for them, who has compassion for them, who cares about them, who understands their weaknesses and as a, as a remedy for it. He doesn't condemn, but nor does he condone. And we, should, we should follow his example and live as children of light. I read a long time ago, freedom is not the right to, to do what we want, but the power to do what we ought. Well, I get that. Freedom is not the right to do what we want, but the power to do what we ought. Jesus in John says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free to do what we ought, not to do what we want. Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So pleased about that. So pleased about that. Do you know, almost every personal encounter I have with God these days seems to include the words, go ye and sin no more. I don't know why. For some reason, in the, when God scolds me, it's always King James he uses.
It's also worth remembering, if the woman was incapable of doing it, Jesus wouldn't have told her to. God doesn't set us tasks that we can't do. Which is why when sometimes people come to us as church leaders or just as people and say, oh, I think God's told me to do this. And you think, no, he hasn't, that's just bonkers. God, that's, that is literally impossible, you can't do that. Oh, God, God, God's told me, no, no, that's just you wanting something badly. He doesn't set as impossible tasks when he says to me, stop doing that and don't do it again. He gives me the power to do that as well. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit empowers us. It's one of the reasons we have the Holy Spirit, to remind us what Jesus said, but it's also to empower us to live right lives. Who do you identify with in this account? If if you identify with somebody, please don't let it be the Pharisees and teach the law. That's, that's what the world thinks we are like. When people think about the church, they think about that. I've, I've studiously... Guys, Van, can you come back up again? Otherwise, I'll just keep going forever. <laughs> I, I, especially when I get on about this topic. I have studiously avoided reading all the Budweiser stuff because I don't want to get into what the church thinks about it. If you don't, if you don't know what that, what's going on in America with Budweiser, it's just keep out of it. Keep your mouth shut. Do you know what? Please, Lord, let the church have learnt that one. Please, Lord, let the church not be opening the mouth stupidly. But it's America, so there will be. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the world thinks of us like the Pharisees and teach the law. Our job is to say, no, we are not. We are like Jesus. Christians, little anointed ones. Paul keeps using that phrase and I love it. Little anointed ones. Christians are little anointed ones. We are, that's us. We have to use this compassion. To finish, I just want to read three scriptures to you to go out with. Exodus 31. God says, Know that I am Jehovah Amkadesh, the God who sanctifies you, the God who makes you holy. He is the God who makes us holy, who sanctifies us, who makes it so that we can come into him, so that we can do that, walk into the presence of God, so that we can go beyond the cross, leaving our sins and our burdens at the cross and where he sanctifies us and go, and we can go on into his presence. Let us then, Hebrews 4, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need because he is Jehovah Amkadesh, the God who sanctifies us. Hebrews 12, you have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched, that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and a storm, a trumpet blast. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Our God is patient. Our God is gracious and our God is compassionate. And we, as Christians, as little anointed ones, we should follow his example with others and with ourselves. we come to an end. If everything I've said to you doesn't make sense, if it doesn't make sense to you at all, if you don't know the God of peace in your life, if you don't know Heavenly Father, if you don't know Jesus as your Saviour, the Holy Spirit as a counsellor, a strengthener, indweller, chain breaker that we sang about earlier. If nothing I've said gives you comfort, then please know there is a comforter. There's a rock high over all, there is a trustworthy cornerstone and his name is Jesus. If you feel unfulfilled, if you want to know there's a God who knows everything and still forgives you, still treats you with compassion, still treats you with care, still treats you with time, still forgives us. There's a prayer we pray when we first follow. And there's a prayer we pray to remind ourselves 
when we're following him that it's still all true that we can still come back to him that we can still say Lord I've done it again and he'll say then you're forgiven again so we're going to pray this we're going to go if you pray I'm just going to walk straight off when we pray this if you, if you, if you pray this prayer in the room please come and find one of us and tell us about it and we'll pray with you if you pray this online there's contact details online please contact us and do that we pray, Lord Jesus, I know I've done things wrong, my thoughts and words and actions. There's so many good things I've not done and so many wrong things I have done. I'm sorry for these wrong things and I turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my saviour to clean me, come in as my Lord to lead me and I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. 